welcome back. We continue with our study of Paul's second letter to Timothy, a very intimate, a very personal, a very practical final letter that Paul would ever write. In fact, I don't think I have told you this yet, but we believe that 2 Timothy is the last written record or the last written letter that Paul would ever write before his death. If there was something else, it wasn't preserved as scripture, but this is the last thing Paul would write that we have in scripture before his death. So it comes very near the time when his work is done. So he's addressing a variety of things in this particular letter with Timothy, his protege, this young man who he's left behind in the city of Ephesus to address a number of problems. Uh, false teachers have come in. He's encouraging him to persevere. He's encouraging him to remember the reason that he's there and the giftedness that he has. He's told him to be strong. He's encouraged him with the words of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when we last left off, he had left him with a four-verse poem that might have been a song that as Timothy was distracted, maybe he could remember these simple words, these simple words. Well, something happens when we get to chapter 2, verse 14, and we're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. The tone changes. It gets a little bit more severe. You think everything should be just wonderful and glossy, but it's going to be a little bit tough and a little bit pushing on Timothy right now. But let, let me give you an example before this, because what we're going to talk about today is words, the words we say and how we say those words. So here's my example. A number of years ago, I worked up the courage to write a letter to the editor of our local paper. Now, in our local paper, and our newspaper is in a city of about 10,000 people, so it's nothing like Tours, very much smaller. But sometimes people will write a letter to the paper, and then they'll publish it in, in the newspaper. Well, there was this letter to the editor that, as I read it, 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 had to, it was an attack, really, on a lot of Christianity. And I said, you know, his argument is not well-reasoned. The things he says are not true of the people that I know. Should I write a letter in reply? I thought, well, I'm a pastor, so I have to keep in mind my role in the community. It's not because I'm afraid of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I just want to make sure I use wise words. So after thinking about it and consulting with a friend or two, I decided to write a letter in reply to this man and then through the newspaper. So I did. And I wrote it as carefully as I did. And these are some of the words that I wrote. I said, Mr., and I won't mention his name, I said, I believe that if there's ever going to be a reasonable discussion on this matter and others like it, that it will have to be a personal over a cup of hot chocolate. I like hot chocolate. I don't like coffee. But he said, I'd like to have a personal discussion over a cup of hot chocolate and not in a heated, overused exaggeration. So if you want to discuss this in person, I'm ready, I'm willing, and I care. I'm trying to be reflective on this. Let me demonstrate to you and others in healthy conversation and acts of kindness that demonstrate the love that motivates me deeply and not the hate that we are so quickly accused of. And then I signed my name. I did not sign my name, Pastor Bruce. I signed my name, Bruce Dick, because I wanted it to be just as a citizen. And so I thought, well, what's he going to say? Or are they going to put my letter in the paper? Well, a couple of days later, there it was. It was in the newspaper. I go, oh, what are people going to think when they read it? So I was very nervous about that. And all of a sudden, one day in church, uh, I had a phone call, and it was this man. He said, I'd like to accept your offer. I said, you would. That'd be great. Can we meet at this local coffee shop in our town? He said, that'd be great. So that afternoon, we sat down, and I had a cup of hot chocolate, and he had a cup of coffee, and we talked about these religious things that he had written about and accused us of. And it, it was a wonderful conversation. So much so that when I see him in the community, that we have a very good friendship, a good, I mean, not a close friendship, but a very accommodating relationship. We appreciate each other and a good common understanding. Go, that's so fascinating that God would use those words that I wrote and I thought very carefully about them, prayed about them, that God would use them in a positive way. And then I thought this. Think how much damage I could have done if I had written harsh words or attacking words. Uh, you're stupid or you're a bad person or you're an evil person and your ideas are terrible. I would have never had a chance to visit with this man 
and talk to him about these spiritual things. And, it, and it's just a great principle that words that we use are very, very powerful. But they can be power for, powerful for good, or they can be powerful for bad or for evil. Because we are followers of Jesus Christ, we have to be very careful with our words that we are not a distraction to the gospel, that our words are an attraction to the gospel. So the words that we've seen so far in this letter have been very positive, very encouraging. But what do you do when you need to say something honestly that is very difficult? Can you still say hard things with gracious words? Yes. And that's what Paul does with Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. We've been talking about being a ship in navigation been talking about navigating toward Christ, navigating towards courage. Well, sometimes we have to navigate away from something. And this is the time when I would say we're going to navigate away from harmful words. And Paul's advice to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 to 19, becomes a very strong encouragement and a warning to stay away from worthless words. So let's take our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll read verses 14 through 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 19. Here's what it says. Remind them of these things, and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Did you hear the tone of those words? They're not uh, harsh words, but they're strong words. They're an admonition for Timothy to say, Timothy, you cannot allow yourself to get caught up in these discussions that are of no value. You cannot allow yourself to use the kind of words that these people are using in their arguments. So, Timothy, navigate away from these worthless words. So here's the first point that I would give you from this first verse. I would say it this way. When we're with the, the people around us, handle words with care. Handle words with care. Here's what he says in verse 14. Remind them of these things. The idea is a present tense continuing action. Keep on reminding them. You'll have to tell them again and again, just like we have to remind little Sasha Sasha, remember to brush your teeth. Sasha, remember to put on your pajamas. Timothy, remind them of these things and charge them, tell them, push them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good. Timothy, they're getting in these arguments about what this means and what this means, and it's not productive to the gospel. You have to tell them to stop. Sometimes as a parent, we get tired, Trudy and I, of trying to remind our children of things over and over again. How many times do we have to tell you the same thing over and over again? But we do remind them because the thing that we have for them to remember is so very important. We don't want to have to remind them. We wish that they would remember it the very first time, but they don't. So we take it upon ourselves as parents to say, I'll tell you over and over again because this is that important. And Timothy, he says, charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good, but it only ruins the hearers. Timothy, people are getting distracted by these things. Timothy, they're getting off onto this path and onto this path, and it's destroying them. It's damaging them, and it's having a negative effect on them. You can't let that happen. The key for Paul, that Paul's arguments were always about the gospel. Again, think of the environment in which Paul is living right now. Nero, Nero is the emperor, as far as we know. It's at that time. Of all of the things that Paul could have argued about, or made a statement, he could have made a political statement about the unfairness of Nero as a Roman Empire. If you recall the, 
the historical account that the city of Rome burned. And a lot of people in this city blame Nero for it. So Nero needed a scapegoat to blame this burning of the city on, so he, he blamed it on Christians. Paul could have written a letter to the editor, and he said, Nero is a fraud, Nero is a liar. He's coming, he, he doesn't even address Nero. Because for Paul, it's always about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It didn't matter to Paul whether Nero was the leader or not. One of the problems that we have in America is that our nation is becoming very divided over the use of words. We no longer know how to have a very good and healthy debate. Instead, we only end up trying to define our own point of view against someone else. And what happens is that's affecting the Christian community. There was a little magazine article from which I pulled a couple of statements that really emphasized the problem that we're having in America, even with Christians right now. And here's what those words said. When people on the streets are asked, what is a Christian? What do they stand for? On nearly every occasion, words come back such as anti-abortion, anti-gay, anti-feminist, anti-welfare, anti-this, anti-that. And words like harsh, self-righteous, intolerant, or mean-spirited come. Yet, another poll of people asked what they think Jesus was like almost universally returns with words like compassionate, nonviolent, peacemaker, and reconciler. And then he concludes by saying this, How do we explain the contradiction here? Either the popular conception of Jesus is mistaken, or we in the church have been following the wrong agenda. See, what's happening in America right now is that Christianity and politics have become very much interwoven. That Christians, in one sense, it's a, in a good sense, have become involved in the political process. But what has happened is that politically and spiritually, those things have got intertwined, that somehow it becomes hard to differentiate between the two of them. See, Paul chose not to be involved in the political matters of his day because he needed the simplicity and the focus of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul would say, I came to win souls not to try to change the emperor. I came to win people to Christ. I came to help start churches and encourage people that would draw them to Christ, that would not divide them. Timothy, please. So in verse 15, he continues his thought. He says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Timothy, I want you to be the kind of follower of Jesus Christ that when you present yourself to him, you present yourself as one who's a worker who worked hard, who has no reason to be ashamed. That I want you to present yourself to God and that you seek his approval. And Timothy, all these people can say all these things about you and they can be distracted from the gospel of Jesus Christ, but you can't. That your goal is to, to have a focus that one day when you stand before God, you will be approved in his eyes. We, we call it this way, an audience of one. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Imagine that you're a star soccer player, a football player. The World Cup has just ended recently. And you're the star soccer player for the best team in the World Cup. There's 80,000 fans, maybe 100,000 fans in the stadium. And the score is tied 0-0. Zero to zero. No one has scored a goal in the entire match. There's only two minutes left. And so the ball is being kicked back and forth, and it's passed here, and it's headed here and it's kicked out of bounds here, and it's back in bounds here, and now there's only one minute left. And all of a sudden, there's a breakaway, and one of your partners kicks the ball across the field, and you have a breakaway, and you're in front of everyone else, and you cut in front of the goalie, and you kick, and the, goal, the ball goes past the goalie and into the goal, and there's a goal. and Everybody is screaming. Everybody is excited. You're going to win the match. You are the World Cup champion for 2010. You've just scored the winning goal. 
there are 80 or 100,000 people in the stands. There might be 100 million people watching you on television, but you only care about one person, your father. You see, what the crowd doesn't know is that your father has bought a ticket to the championship game. He got a ticket, and he's on the third row in a certain section over on one side of the stadium. And as soon as the final, the final gun sounds to end the World Cup match, and you are the world champions in football, you don't care about all the fans. You only want to see one person, your father. And so you look, and you're running around the stadium, and people are trying to, to, to catch your attention and to pat you on the hand or pat you on the head or pat you on the back, and they're all very excited. And you're running, 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 looking for your father, and you're trying to find the section in which he's sitting. And all of a sudden, you catch his gaze, and there he is right over there. And all the people are screaming, and all the people are cheering, and people are pouring out onto the field. And you say, all I want to do is get to my father. And you get to your father, and your father has this enormous smile on his face. Tears are running down his face. He is so proud of you. You have scored the winning goal in the greatest soccer match of, of, of the generation, or maybe of all time, and your father is so pleased with you. It's almost as if you don't even hear the sounds of the other people. All you see is your father and his joy and his tears. If you can take the emotion and the passion of what I've just described to you, that's what Paul is saying to Timothy here. Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker has no need to be ashamed. Do your best to present yourself to God as approved. No one who has any reason to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of God. I think of those of you who are in occupation, and you're working for a boss who doesn't understand the things about God or the gospel, that you live your life in such a way that when you stand before God the Father one day, God the Father says, son, daughter, well, you live the gospel. You handle the word of truth in a correct way. It has the idea, that idea behind uh, rightly handling the word of truth has the idea of a surgeon cutting a straight line. He's cutting straight so that he doesn't damage any of the organs in which he's trying to get to. He has the idea of cutting in a straight line. It's also used of a farmer who, when he starts to plow his field, wants to plow in a straight line. When, when I was a farmer, and before GPS came along that guides all their tractors these days, it, it was my passion to try to plow or cultivate in a straight line. So what I would do would be this. I would start on one end of the field. I would look to the other end of the field for maybe a post or a rock or an electrical pole or a tree. And I would say, I'm going to fix my eyes on that tree or that post, and I will drive completely straight as much as I can. Timothy, I want you to handle God's word like that. If there's one thing that has given me terror as I have prepared to come and teach all of you, it is this phrase. As I was preparing to teach on First and Second Timothy, I, I was pleading with the Lord, Lord, what if I teach something wrong? What if I say something wrong? What if, what if I, I, I talk about a certain word and I say the wrong meaning or I lead someone astray? Lord, I want to teach right. See, when we have that passion, God says, I will direct your words. You can trust me. I will cause you to say what I want you to say in the way I want you to say. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Rush Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150.
or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.